welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Deborah Cobre. Well, stand with me one more time before you put your lovely bums down on those seats and let's pray. My husband so beautifully gets down on his knees, my son and my son-in-law, Pastor Dan and Pastor Luke. But honestly, if I try to get down on my knees with these heels, I would never get back up. So Lord, I humbly ask to be excused from kneeling because of the vanity of these heels. So let's pray. Father, thank you for tonight. Thank you that you are a good God, that you love us, that you have a plan for success and not for failure. Lord, though our world may be shaking and life may be uncertain, things may not make sense, two and two is not making four in this economy, Lord, I thank you that you have the answers and you hold us steady and your kingdom is infallible and infinite. And so, Father, tonight we ask in Jesus' name that the Holy Spirit, the revelator of the church, would come and teach us, would come and speak your word to us. In every situation, in every heart tonight, there's so many scenarios in this auditorium, Father. You know each and every one of your people. I pray tonight that they would hear your voice specifically for their situation, for where they are, and that you would speak then to them tonight. And Lord, I also ask tonight that as we preach Jesus and as we teach him, that Lord, you would confirm the word with signs, wonders, miracles, and gifts of the Holy Spirit tonight. That those that are sick among us tonight, that are even in pain right now, Father, I just pray for a healing presence over them in Jesus' name. For those that are confounded in their minds, and Lord, there's just been a, a demonic buzzing, Lord, and there's just no peace. I just pray peace over them now in Jesus' name. I take authority over every wicked demonic power that would try to stop or usurp the will of God from being done in this service or in this campus tonight. We bind every demonic power now in the name of Jesus by the authority of the name of Jesus. And Father, we thank you now. And you said we can bind in earth what you've bound in heaven. And you said we could loose on earth what you've loosed in heaven. So Father, we release the goodness of God, the teaching ministry of your spirit. We release, Lord, all that you want to do tonight in our hearts and our lives in the mighty name of Jesus and all the saints of God said, amen. amen. Have a seat. Let's go. The title of tonight's message is Living and Giving His Compassion. Now, Sunday, Jim was in Hebrews chapter 4. It's not on the overhead, but I'm just going to take my Bible right now. If you've got your Bibles, and if you don't, pull out your iPads or your phones or whatever and open up those Bibles because the Word of God is what changes us. It is spirit-breathed. It is alive and quick and sharp and powerful. It is the only thing that will change us, and that's why we teach the Word around here. In Hebrews chapter 4, I'm in James chapter 4, no wonder it didn't make any sense. Jim started with verse 14, seeing then, after describing in Hebrews, of course, Hebrews is the book that is being written to Jews, the book of Hebrews. And they are comparing an old covenant with a new covenant. The old promises of God and the old blood covenant to the new promise of God and the new blood covenant. There's an old priesthood and now there's a new priesthood. There was the high priests of men chosen by God and high priests in the law that priests represented man to God and God to man. And so they're describing the priesthood, the law, all of these things. And the writer of Hebrews is, is, is pinning out and, and teaching the book to the church and teaching that he is a more excellent, he has a more excellent ministry, a more excellent priesthood, a more excellent covenant. He is God in the flesh and he is our high priest he is our sacrifice he is the lamb of god his priesthood his ministry his blood sacrifice all that he has given us through his blood sacrifice is so much better than the old covenant and so he has described he is beginning to describe these things and he says seeing then that we have verse 14 a great high priest who has passed through the heavens jesus the son of god let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but as but was in all points tempted as we are yet without sin. And Jim took those words, who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, just that little phrase right there, brilliantly took that phrase on Sunday and Sabbath, 
And he began to expound on what that meant and brought forth the topic of compassion. Because the word sympathize there is also the word compassion. Now, compassion is an, is an odd word in the Greek, and we don't speak it, so I'm not going to even try to begin to try to say that word in the Greek because I couldn't. But just in practical 21st century terms, compassion is a great and deep feeling, feeling, empathy for someone else's trouble plus the desire to want to get them out of it. In other words, not only do I feel your pain, but I want to bring resources to ease your pain. Compassion, in short, is God's love in action. Compassion is God's love in action. It's the agape of God. It's the love that never fails. It's the infinite love. It's the love that you cannot define. It's the love that you cannot measure. It's the love that never gives up, never quits, never grow old, never gets tired, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things. The agape of God, the love of God. God is love. It's his love in action, in the issues, in the everyday dealings of everyday humanity. And this high priest who represents us to God and God to us, our great high priest became a man. God wrapped himself in flesh. God, the star breather, God, the maker of galaxies and heavens, God who was with the Lord as wisdom, the one that created the heavens and the earth, God, the word, God made flesh, stepped out of eternity, stepped into a human body, wrapped himself in flesh, and experienced every trial, every test, every sorrow, every sickness, every disease, Everything that you and I as human beings will ever experience, whether we are young or old, no matter what nation or time zone we will ever live in, Jesus Christ, as the high priest, has experienced that pain and that suffering in a human body. Therefore, he is qualified to be our high priest because, bottom line, San Bernardino talk, he just plain gets us. He just gets us. God never suffered before he wrapped himself in flesh, because he's God. But now God stepped out of not his deity, but he stepped out of that form, wrapped himself in flesh, and he is still a man at the throne of God, the man, Christ Jesus. He became the last Adam for you and I. And this amazing king, our God, the God of heaven and earth, the maker of heaven and earth, has an incredible love that oozes out of him, that just goes before him, surrounds him, follows him, overwhelms him. You touch him, it comes out of him. This love in action is called compassion. The feelings of understanding what somebody else is going through, not judging them, not turning a hard heart, but bringing resource, help, and aid to that one in need. Compassion, love, and action. So Jim taught on Sunday, and he said, well, who receives compassion? Four categories, broken humanity, the unfortunate. Now, broken humanity is all of humanity, so every one of us are a candidate. The unfortunate. Have you ever noticed or ever thought, or maybe you're one that was born with some kind of a, a handicap, Maybe some type of a genetic disease. Maybe you're in a wheelchair. Maybe one of your loved ones is. Maybe you happen to be born in a nation that's at war. Maybe you have contracted a sickness or a disease. Or maybe you've just been born into a dysfunctional family that absolutely just took the lights right out of your heaven when you were a child and you've been unfortunate all your life. The ones that just don't have a level playing field. The ones that are weak and, and infirm. The ones that just don't have everything maybe that somebody else will have. The unfortunate. Compassion goes to the unfortunate. Not just broken humanity, not just the unfortunate, but compassion goes to the brokenhearted. God is near to the brokenhearted. Jesus understands what it is to be rejected by humanity. He understands what it is to be rejected by men. He understands what it is to be betrayed he understands betrayal. He understands every human emotion that will break our heart. And he has been there. He's experienced it. He's walked through it without sinning. He is qualified not only just to be our high priest, but he's qualified to bring us the kingdom of heaven and aid that comes with that miraculous, invisible kingdom. 
So broken humanity, the unfortunate, the brokenhearted, and the last one that Jim spoke about was the unclean, the untouchables, the ones that nobody wants to get near or touch, whether they're the homeless or whether they're the terminally ill, whether they are the mentally retarded, whether they are the blind, as in Jesus' day, that were beggars and cast out of the home, whether they were the lepers that once you contracted leprosy because it was such a volatile disease and because it was so contagious. By the law, the Hebrew law, if you contracted leprosy, you were a castaway and you were dead even while you were alive from your family and you were sent off to die by yourself. And they had, they had leper colonies at that time. Now, you and I don't see leprosy much in our in our world, but leprosy would be equivalent to the most heinous disease that mankind could contract today that would be very contagious and you would be absolutely untouchable and completely isolated and alone. The unclean. Those that have sinned so much that they're too far gone. The throwaways, the ones that you don't even want to deal with, the ones that have just blown it too much and it's done, it's over, they're under judgment. Jesus brought forth compassion, his love in action, not just great feeling and empathy, but just also the resource of the kingdom to heal the lepers, to cleanse the maimed, to open the blind eyes, to heal the brokenhearted, to take broken humanity and mend humanity. John Newton, who wrote Amazing Grace, that great pastor in England that, that, that wrote that amazing song that we've sung for centuries, who was a slave trader. And from a slave trader, he was gloriously delivered and saved, and he became a pastor. And he was directly responsible with William Wilberforce to absolutely er eradicate slavery from the British Isles. God used this man to, to understand grace. And this man said, mankind is broken. John Newton said, man is broken. He lives by mending. And the grace of God is the glue. Compassion. And so we saw on Sunday where compassion comes from and who, who compassion is delivered to. Tonight I want to look after this. I just want to look at three things tonight about. So now knowing that and looking at compassion, I have to judge my heart. Because I don't know about you, but my compassion quotient can be very, very small. I can get what is called compassion fatigue. I don't want to see one more skinny baby on television in Africa. I don't want to hear about one more problem. I don't want to know about one more person that doesn't have enough money to pay their light bills. I don't want to see one more mess. Has anybody ever been there besides me? If you're honest, you're going to say yes, because we're all there. Because basically, our old natures want to absolutely be that default program in us. You know in your computers when you've got the default, it just goes back to the original program? You know what I'm talking about? Well, sin nature is the default program. And the sin nature of me and the sin nature of you is such that we are selfish. We are self-centered. It's about me before it's about anybody else. And it's about me, mine, and the ones I love. And that's about it. That's my small circle. That's where I live. And don't really try to break in there and don't try to mess with me because that's about all I can handle. Are you tracking with me? Am I talking to anybody in this church? Can we just have an honest message here? So there are times when I hear about compassion, it's like, I don't want to hear it. Because I don't measure up to that compassion. But you see, it's not about me, it's about him. It's not about whether I'm in a season of great compassion or I'm in a low quotient in my life. It's not about whether I'm in sliding or I'm backsliding. It's not about what my feelings are. It is about what God says and who God is and what God is destined for my life as a believer. And so I've got to look at compassion and not just feel bad or guilty or shamed. But I've got to look at this and say, okay, Lord, I need to take an honest look at my life, my heart, my church, my family, my circle of influence, my friends. What am I doing with my life? Am I looking like Jesus? Am I the hands and the feet and the eyes and the ears and the actions of my Savior? He went from place to place doing good, 
healing all who were oppressed of the devil. Wherever he went, he preached the kingdom of God. He brought the kingdom of God. He shook up the world. He absolutely took Jerusalem and Israel, and he turned Israel inside out and right side up, and they didn't know what to do with them. And he says, now I've left you the Holy Spirit. You are my church, and I expect you to look like me, act like me, do my deeds, greater deeds than what I did. You'll do because there's more of you. And if you'll believe this, you'll change your world. So where am I? How do I do this? How do I do this compassion thing when I mess up and fail so much of the time? And so many of my days, I can look at and if I could judge a compassion quote, and I'd have to shake my head and say, Lord, let's just put that one under the blood. And let's start again. So I want to give you three things tonight about the package of compassion that is on you and on me. It's not only on us because we're loved of heaven and we've received compassion and forgiveness as believers, but it's also in us because God not only wants to work in me, but God wants to work through me. And so there's this package. If I was going to buy a computer and I was going to, I had certain needs and I'm starting a business and I'm going to need certain programs, maybe QuickBooks, maybe a word processing system, maybe a graphics program. I'm going to have to buy some programs and I'm going to have to program that computer. And once those programs have been set into that computer, now I can turn that computer on and that computer will be able to bring forth that which I have downloaded into it kind of a matrix thing. Are you with me? Well, it's the same thing with us. God has downloaded into every one of our spirits the love of God, which has been shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit, the compassion of God. It's in me. Whether I use it or not, or whether I'm stirring it up or not, is really up to me. But it's already in me, and it's in you. Now, this package that's in us, this gift that's in us and on us, tonight I just want to look at three things, because we could teach on this Till Jesus comes, and we would, we, we would not exhaust it. But just three things tonight in the next 20 minutes, three little things about the package, what it looks like, and how I'm going to use it in my life and my everydays. All right? Because I want to have compassion. I don't want to be a hard-hearted, self-absorbed, self-centered woman, whether I'm young or old or man. So three things tonight. Number one, we're going to look at compassion brings the package of freedom from critical judgment. You see, I can't be compassionate and release the program, release the power of compassion in my life if I am judgmental towards people. If I have a critical spirit, forget it. That will absolutely mess up the program of compassion in me. It can't function in judgmentalism. Compassion will not be released in the power of the kingdom of God. Now listen. We're going to look at this in the third point tonight about free from worry. But compassion is power. It's the power of the love of God. It's when Jesus saw the blind man and they wanted to see and compassion came out of him. As the compassion came out of him, the miracle working power of the kingdom was demonstrated through that compassion and the blind saw. When he looked at the crowds and they were hungry because they hadn't eaten for three days. And he was moved with compassion because they were sheep without a shepherd and they were hungry. Compassion moved through him and brought forth the demonstration of the great show and tell to his disciples of the fish and the loaves. And 5,000 men plus thousands of women and children were feeded through the divine multiplication of earth's resource of five fish and seven loaves of bread. Are you tracking with me? Compassion brings the supernatural. It actually is the power of God in action. So if I am judgmental, I stop the flow of the power of God moving to me and moving through me to people that God wants to touch with his love and compassion. So let's just look at this just as an example. So number one, if I'm going to operate in the compassion of God... I'm going to see that compassion releases me from critical judgment. Now, the, the example is the woman caught in adultery in John chapter 8. But let me just quickly go to Matthew chapter 7. And I want to talk to you about what God says about judgmentalism. Judgment. 
Chapter 7, verse 1 and 5, and I've been here this year, but let's just go there again. Judge not that you be not judged. For with the judgment you judge, you'll be judged. With the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. It's a law. What I give out will come back to me. It's a boomerang law. God says to me, why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but do not consider the plank in your own? Contrast. Sequoia in my eye, splinter in my brother's eye. We've been here. We were just here the last time I taught. How can you say to your brother, let me remove the speck from your eye and look, a plank's in your own eye. Man, you're going to take that man out with that tree hanging out of your eye. This is kind of humorous. Hypocrite. First remove the plank from your own eye, and then you'll see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Now, we see this in demonstration with the woman caught in adultery. Talking about compassion. She's caught in the act. They bring her to Jesus, minus the man. They're trying to trap him. It's his last week on the earth. They're in the Feast of Tabernacles. So I don't know what time it was, but I know it was the Feast of Tabernacles, so I don't know if it was his last week or not. Who cares? But they're trying to trap him. They want to arrest him. They hate him. He's got too much power. They don't know what to do with him. So they throw this woman at his feet, and they say, the law says she should be stoned. You know the story. Now, I'm talking about judgmentalism and pointing the finger of judgment. And I guess I want to ask the question, how does God point his finger? So here she is. I don't know if she had her clothes on or not. I'm assuming she had something on. Caught in the act, so hopefully they let her get dressed. Throw her down in the dust. We've all seen the movies. And Jesus just doesn't say a word. He just stoops in, in the dirt. He's in the dirt. God's in the dirt. He takes his finger, and he starts to write in the dirt. Now, I don't know what he writes. He doesn't tell us what he's going to write. I said to him today, can I ask you in heaven? I want to know what you wrote. And he says, it's none of your business. If it was, I would have told you. <laughs> he writes in the dirt, and he says this in John chapter 8. He says to them, so when they continued asking him, verse 7, he raised himself up and said to them, who... He who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. There he's writing in the dirt. We know the story. Here's the point. Judgmentalism. The one that could throw the stone, Jesus, didn't. The only one that was qualified, that had no sin, was the one that said, I'm not going to throw a stone. Compassion. The others were judging. And as he's writing in the stand, they leave one by one. God gets in the dirt with us. How he points his finger is he writes his word in our hearts. It convicts us. He who is without sin among you, let him cast the first stone. And so if I want to have compassion moving through me, i got to hear that word in my heart. As I am so quick to judge those that God may want to use me to bring compassion to. As I judge the broken humanity, as I judge the poor, as I judge the sinner, as I judge this, as I judge that. Because every one of us in here, every cute, little, every cute little body in here, every precious little soul in here, we all have some kind of judgmental opinions and prejudice, every one of us. Whether you are white or black or red or yellow or you are blue with purple polka dots, you have got some prejudice and judgmental opinions. And God says that's going to stop it. It's going to halt it. It won't even flow through you. So just some facts about judgmentalism I just want to read to you. Number one, we naturally judge too harshly. It's common to impute our evil to others, but to think our goodness is uniquely our own. I've read this to the women's ministry. I may have read it here. I'm getting old, so I don't know if I'm preaching the same sermon, so just bear with me because you need to hear it again. <laughs> Number two, everyone, no matter how excellent and mature in Christ, will have glaring inconsistencies. We judge people not so much by how they stand to God, is by the inconvenient or disagreeable way in which they stand to us. Judgmentalism. It is much easier to see evil than good. Remember, evil by its own nature is more visible than goodness. Evil is like the world on the self-defensive, loud and easily recognized. Goodness like God is often hidden and harder to see and hear. It partakes of the nature of God and imitates the ways of God. It's quiet, unobtrusive. It is meek and will suffer instead of defending itself. So what we think looks evil, we don't have a clue. Four, we cannot see the struggle of the heart. 
When we see evil in others, we can never see the amount of inward resistance which that person has given to the evil or the amount of humiliation and sorrow which they may have for their own failures and defects. Judgmentalism. Satan is active, but grace is more active. To judge others without taking into consideration the widespread tyranny of evil spirits would be unscriptural and unjust. You and I don't know the heinous violence of hell. Jesus said to Peter, Satan wants to sift you like wheat. But I've prayed for you. And when you come again and stand, you will strengthen your brothers. You and I cannot measure hell's forces. But they're real and they are there. Last one. God's mercy is much greater than our judgment. The severity of our judgment is an inflexible index to the immaturity of love in our spiritual state. God's mercy gives time, makes allowances, and is compassionate. The more like Jesus we become, the slower our rush to judgment and the swifter our grasp to lay hold of compassion and mercy for others. In other words, the finger pointing as we mature slows down, writes in the sand, and says and reminds their own spirit, he who is without sin, let him cast the first stone. Compassion cannot operate with a spirit of criticism and judgmentalism. So compassion comes free from judgmentalism. The package of compassion number two comes with no strings attached. What does that mean? It means compassion doesn't have its own little agenda. It's not a political talking point. It's not a bonus brownie to put online that you're doing this and this and this. It's not bragging rights on how good we are. Compassion and the miracle working power that comes with compassion is quiet and hidden and has no agenda. It comes with no strings attached. When Jim and I started the, the Rock and we began our outreach ministries and we started feeding people, the first thing God spoke to me as we started to take the groceries out was, Debbie, I want you to go and you feed people with no strings attached. They don't get food if they come to church. Just give them food. But God, just give them food. Let me give you scripture. Matthew chapter 5, verse 43 through 40, 45, it says, But I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully misuse you and persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and the unjust. What? You see, God loves humanity. I just read you about judgmentalism. We can't possibly judge the heart. We don't know the viciousness of hell. There's many things we don't understand. God gets it. God knows it. God understands it. He causes the rain to come and the sun to shine on the just and the unjust. The undeserving, the profane, the sinner. The one that deserves hell. When I was sitting there dropping acid as a young woman in the hills of Santa Barbara, one dark night, it was in the 60s and the 70s, and I was total full-on hippie. It's probably why I can't find my way around a paper bag right now. It might be a little brain damage in the GPS department. <laughs> I remember very distinctly as I had dropped too much acid that night, I was on the hills the cliffs of Santa Barbara overlooking the ocean, my mind was about to leave. I was about to have a freak out. I was about to lose my mind. I heard a voice saying, oh, no, you don't. And instantly I was sober and sane. My mind was back in where it was supposed to be, and I never dropped acid again. The compassion of God at that moment on my life, looking ahead to what I would become in the years ahead that I hadn't even yet met him, hadn't even turned my heart to him, yet the compassion of God to a, a drunken acid freak on the hills of Santa Barbara who didn't care about life and just wanted to do another trip, here comes heaven and puts my brain back in my body, gets me sober, scares hell right out of me, brings the supernatural to me. Anybody else would have said she's no good, she's had too much sin, get rid of her. He causes the rain and the sun 
to shine on the just and the unjust. No strings attached. See, I don't know that that very one that's in front of me, or God wants me to minister to, or God wants me to do something for, pray for, give something to, give my time, my love, a word of encouragement, a smile, some kindness, a miracle working prayer. I don't know that that one has a destiny in heaven and a destiny with the kingdom of God. I can't tell that. That's not mine to judge. It is only mine to do. And I can only say to you that as I read the New Testament and as I image these things in my mind and I think about the early church, there must have been some real miracle stories in that upper room with 120 people. I wonder if Bartimaeus was there. I wonder if that leper who said, Lord, if you're willing, you can heal me. And Jesus touched him with compassion and said, I'm willing and healed him. I wonder if that leper was up in the upper room. I know whoever the 120 were that stayed and waited for the Holy Spirit, I know that, boy, someday if we get to have a group time, we're going to hear stories that are absolutely going to be amazing of how Jesus touched them with compassion. No strings attached. Not my will, God, but yours. 2 Corinthians 5.15 says, And he died for all, that those who live should live no longer for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. What a verse. Listen to what the Holy Spirit is teaching us tonight on compassion. No strings attached. But God, I don't feel like it. But God, I can't do it. But God, I don't have, I don't have the heart for it. But God, I don't have the talent. I don't have the resources. But God, I don't want to. But God, but Debbie, but church, you're dead. You're dead. It's not about what you feel. It's not about what you want. It's not about your agendas. It's not about how you're feeling and what's in it for you. It's about what's in it for me. I'm the king of heaven, and I have said you're my church, and I need to use you and move my miracle working power through you. Be available. Don't be stubborn. And he died for all, Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 5, 15. That those who live should live no longer for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. God's compassion flows from his heart through ours to others. No strings attached. I'm going to have to focus then on this revelation. If that's true, no strings attached, then... The needs of others are as important as my own. The needs of others are as important as my own. Philippians 2.4 says, Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. Listen, God has always held his people responsible and accountable for the broken and for the unfortunate, for the unclean. He's always held us accountable. He's not held the government. It's not the government's job. It's our job. It starts with us. We can give it to the government, and the government will take it, but it will come with strings attached. I know because we've written grants. We've gotten $250,000 worth of grants. I love my country. I'm not here to bash the government. But the government of this world, the democracy that I live in, is not the government of my God. The government of my God has a different agenda. And when I hand it over, the responsibility, to one who's not anointed and appointed to do it, then it's going to come with strings attached. And God has always held me accountable. Isaiah 58. You all right with me? We've got just a few more minutes. You okay? Let me just read this to you. Now, what I did is I took Isaiah 58 from verses 6 all the way down to 14, and I divided it up into responsibilities and incentives, what happens when we do what God's asked us to do. So I want to look at what are we accountable for? Now, this is the fast that God has chosen for his people, for you and I. He says, is this not the fast that I have chosen? This is what I want you to do. This is how I want you to come before me. He says, to loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, to let the oppressed go free. That you break every yoke. 
Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and that you bring to your house the poor who are cast out? When you see the naked, that you cover him and not hide yourself from your own flesh. Your own flesh is your family. Have you ever said no more drama? <laughs> Turn off the lights, lock the door, don't answer the phone. <laughs> of course you have, so have I. I have 12 grandchildren. <laughs> Isaiah 58, 12, these are the responsibilities, says, you'll use the old rubble of past lives to rebuild anew. Build the foundations from out of your past. You'll be known as those who can fix anything, restore old ruins, Rebuild and renovate, make the community livable again. It's not the Democratic Party or the Republican Party. It is the church of the living God who has the power of God that is to make the community livable again. And it's tax free. And it's miraculous. When we started, no strings attached. Number one, frees us from judgmentalism. Compassion comes with no strings attached. Last one. Compassion comes worry-free. It comes worry-free. You know what that means? It means it's not absolutely upside down with tension, stress, guilt, shame, compassion fatigue, weariness, fear, unbelief, doubt, and all that goes along with the stress and worry of our lives. If I do this for them, if I give this to them, if I share this with them, will I have enough for me? Hmm. I don't know about you, but I think that. Oh, you know, you look at me like you're all so good. <laughs> Please. You naughty boys and girls, I know you. You're my family, and you're just like me. Am I talking to you tonight? Yes. Compassion comes worry-free. Jesus didn't say, oh, my gosh. If I heal the woman that's just touched the hem of my garment because virtue power went out of me, that means I'm going to have less for the rest of the day when Jairus' daughter needs to be raised from the dead. Hello. Because Jesus knew that there was an infinite resource available to him from heaven. That it wasn't earth's resources that he needed. It was only earth's resources that were just the priming of the pump. In the old days, when you had to go outside and you had to pump the water out of the faucet. My mother and my dad lived in Wisconsin. They're boo I'm a boomer. They lived, they were born 1920. They had outside plumbing. My mom said, you'd have to prime the pump. You'd have to pour water, a bucket of water on that pump, get that pump to have some water in it so we could actually bring up the water that was in the well. It was called priming the pump. Have you ever heard that colloquial in the English language? Priming the pump. You are the tech generation. You don't go outside and prime your pumps. But it took water to get water. All Jesus needs is a little bit of earth resource to prime heaven's pump. He said, what's in your hand? What have you got? Moses had a rod. They had seven loaves and five loaves of fish. Whatever it is, we had a bag of beans and we had some rice in our food pantry and that's how we started feeding the poor, which was all of us. We took the beans and rice home after we gave it to everybody else. <laughs> and from that came the miraculous warehouse that we have now. From that fish and seven loaves came all the feeding of the thousands. From the touch of faith on his garment came more virtue power that healed Jairus' dead daughter. You see, you never run out of resource with compassion. The more you give, the more you get. The more you do, the more you'll have. The more you step out, the more ministry there'll be. You feel like you're dried up and there's nothing in your life. It's because you are stagnant. You're a, you're a well and, a, and your water, living water's in you. Water comes in and water's got to go out. 
And if it's not going out, if you're not serving, if you're not stepping out, if you're not doing something with the kingdom of God, if you're not praying for the stranger. Man, I was in downtown L.A. with Eleanor yesterday. We were buying clothes. We were witnessing all over, up and down those streets to those girls, from Begonia to Sylvie. Where's Eleanor? We had such a great time. Compassion. Here's this beautiful little girl model that's trying clothes on me, and she's in this some high-end little dress store, you know, that's wholesale. Oh, you don't care about it, man, but just listen. She was just adorable and beautiful. I mean, you know, she's pictures of her up there modeling. She's half naked, you know, and she's a little heathen. I mean, just beautiful little girl. Now, I could have gotten all self-conscious and just wanted to get out of there, but God said, no, you ask her her name. You find out who she is. Her name is Begonia. With French accent, Begonia. I said, so what's the French for Begonia? Begonia. I said, it's the same word, just has an accent. But anyway. <laughs> Compassion came out of my heart from heaven. This beautiful, beautiful girl from France who was just searching little Sylvie from France. Compassion. Compassion. God wants to use you wherever you are. Whether you're at the bank, whether you're at the grocery store, whether you're on the job, whether you're walking outside of the job, and you meet somebody, and instead of just walking by them, God says, stop. Look. Be willing to look at the hard things in front of us, regardless of the drama. Worry-free. Don't avoid the uncomfortable conversation or the hard questions for the sake of comfort. Worry-free. Refuse to be intimidated by the family or friends that will judge your actions as foolish. Worry-free. Don't say, this is not my problem. If it's right in front of you, maybe it's not your problem, but if it's in front of you, it is now qualified as the Good Samaritan, and it is your problem, and it's mine. God wants me to step into the dirt of life, roll up my sleeves, get on my knees, and give out the mercy and the compassion of God, understanding that there are miracle-working resources that God wants to get to me and through me. From healing blind eyes, to feeding the masses, to touching the unclean, to encouraging one. Maybe tomorrow on the, on the job, maybe it's just going to be just that one person that just gets your last nerve. Oh, and you can't stand them. Maybe somebody owes you money and you just, it's bugged you. God says, pray for him. Let me use you with the compassion of heaven to bring forth the miracle working power of God. This is my last part of worry-free. Jesus knew there was an infinite resource in heaven. And there's an incentive in this. Luke chapter 6, my, my, uh, pretty much my last scripture because I should be done. It says, judge not, you'll not be judged. Can I get that up? We've looked at this in Matthew. Now we're going to look at it in Luke. Judge not, that you not be judged. Condemn not, you'll not be condemned. Forgive and you'll not be forgiven. So we see that. But listen to this, verse 38. Give. Give. Right after that, give. Give. Not talking about money. What is it talking about? It's talking about forgiveness. It's talking about prayer. It's talking about compassion. Give, and it will be given unto you. Good measure. Pressed down and shaken together. Will God give into your bosom? The more I give of myself, my time, what's in my hand, what's in front of me, God says the more will come back to you. There is an incentive in this. Now, there is no strings attached, so I don't have compassion so that I get. But I want you to know that you can't live this life of compassion, free from judgmentalism, with no strings attached, and worry-free. You cannot live this life without becoming the richest people on the planet. It is impossible because this is what God says. He says, give and it'll be given back to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. But, oh, now let's read the last part of Isaiah 58 because I told you the laundry list of what I'm responsible for, to feed the hungry, to clothe the naked to take care of my own flesh. I'm accountable for that, but look what happens, good measure, pressed down, shaken together when I do it. Look what happens. Isaiah chapter 58, 
Verse 8 says, then your light shall break forth like the morning. Then your healing shall spring forth speedily. Then your righteousness shall go before you. And the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. Then you'll call and the Lord will answer. You'll cry and he'll say, here I am. Then your light will dawn in the darkness. And your darkness will be as the noonday. You'll live in the light and not the dark. Then the Lord will guide you continually. You want to know the will of God? You want to know your destiny? Just start living free from judgmentalism. Start living and giving with no strings attached. Start living worry-free. And it says here that the Lord will guide you continually. Satisfy your soul in drought. Recession is drought. Ouch. Did you see that? Getting a little excited. God promises he'll satisfy us in the drought. We want to do the miraculous in this recession. We want to pay off this church. We want to increase our outreach. We want to build a Christian school. We want another campus. I want to see showers for the homeless. There's all kinds of things and agendas and, 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 and dreams in our hearts. He says he'll satisfy us in drought. Strengthen our bones. That means when you're old like I am, you're going to be fresh and flourishing, and you're not going to be all stowed up with arthritis and sickness and disease. But you're still going to be young enough to keep doing something, even though you're old. It doesn't matter because the kingdom's on you. You shall be like a watered garden and a spring of water whose waters do not fail. Then you shall delight yourself in the Lord, and he will cause you to ride upon the high places of the earth. You see, when you live worry-free, and it's not about me or what is mine or ours, but you know the resources are infinite, replenishable. So what if you lost money? So what if you gave and they didn't give back? So what if somebody hurt you? So what? Give yourself permission to get hurt because you're going to get hurt. Give yourself permission to be emotional because Jesus is emotional. Don't be constipated with your emotions. It's not a sign of weakness. It's a sign of stupidity. Because God's put you on this planet to feel for other people. And you can't do that if your emotion chip is turned off. God's called us to be free from judgment. He's called us. He's absolutely called us to live with no strings attached. And he's called us to live worry-free. And we will be fresh and flourishing in the drought, he promises. Did you get something out of tonight? Oh, it's wonderful to laugh and have fun. It's good to be men and women in the house of God. To be comfortable in our own skin. To know who we are. To be happy that we are who we are. Because we're made in the image of God. We have found him. Or better, actually, he's found us. He's not lost, we were. When I was on those cliffs of Santa Barbara in 1977, 23 years old, my goodness, 27, whatever I was, so lost, so hurt, the brokenhearted, so messed up, a throwaway girl. He found me because I was so lost. And his compassion, his compassion, just overwhelmed me. When nobody wanted me, he did. When I'd messed up too much, he said, it's okay. If you'll give me your life, I can take it. And I can bring good out of the bad. It's an amazing thing to come meet up with the living God of the universe. To know that he's real. That he knows you. He's not mad at you, but he actually loves you. It's an amazing, amazing thing, and you're changed forever. I don't know who you are tonight. I don't know where you're at with God, but I need to ask you a question. If you were to die tonight through no fault of your own because we are frail and fragile, we cannot keep ourselves alive for five minutes. Try holding your breath. We're fragile. And yet God's made us fearfully and wonderfully. If you were to die tonight through no fault of your own, where would you open your eyes? Where would you spend eternity? If you're saying, well, I hope I'd open my eyes in heaven. Not sure there's an eternity. I think I'm going to heaven. I've been a good person. Yeah, it's 
where I'm headed. If you're saying, gosh, I'm a mess. Regardless of what you're saying, I need to talk to you. Because if you said, I hope I'm going to heaven, I really need to talk to you because God doesn't say. You can hope your way to heaven. If you said, I'm a good person, I think I'm going to heaven. God doesn't say we can think our, our way to heaven. He doesn't say we can have behavior modification and we can behave our way to heaven. God says, there's only one way to heaven. God says, you must be born again. You see, what is it that makes you and me think that God is going to let us into his heaven? The world says there's all roads that lead to heaven. The Hindus say there's nirvana. Buddha says whatever. The Muslims have paradise. There's all these roads and all these world religions, but God doesn't say all the world religions lead, lead to heaven. He said, this isn't about religion. This is about relationship. There's only one way to heaven. It's through my son, Jesus Christ. People say, oh, you Christians, you're just so intolerant. We're not intolerant. We just know there's a God in heaven. There's only one God. He's the real God. He's written a book. It's the Bible. It's true. It's proved itself out, and he says there's only one way. It's through his son, Jesus Christ. It's not through good behavior. It's not through church attendance. It's not even by believing that Jesus is the son of God because the devil believes Jesus is the son of God, and he's not going to heaven. This is not about religion. This is about a relationship. This is about not what you know in your head. It is about what you've done in your heart. Because we're Americans, and if I said to you, do you know Jesus, you would say yes. 80% of Americans say they're Christians, but God doesn't say it's what you know in your head. He says it's what you've done with your heart. I can't behave my way. I can't hope my way. I can't act my way. I can't religion my way into heaven. There's only one way and one way only. God says, you must be born again. Now, what does that mean to be born again? God knew man's sin. God knew our screw up. God knew his justice and he knew his justice had to be met or he would not be the righteous God. He knew that you and I could not save ourselves because we had no life in us to save ourselves and no power to do it. So that's why he sent himself. He sent his son Jesus, wrapped in flesh, became a man, walked the human experience, and climbed on a Roman cross, took the sin of the world upon himself. And Jesus Christ says, if you will look to that cross and believe that I am who I said I am, and surrender your life to me. Let me be Savior. Let me be Lord. Lord means boss. You'll be born again. He'll take you out of the kingdom of darkness. He'll bring you into the kingdom of God. He'll join you to the Father. You'll be washed and cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, these may be uncomfortable words, but these are words of truth. And you will be born again. That night on the cliffs of Santa Barbara, I met God. That night, God took a throwaway woman, said, I'll clean you up. I'll give you life. But it's not what I know in my head. It's what I do with my heart. God has already done all he can do. He has climbed that cross. He has taken on the sin of the world. He experienced every human travesty. Every sin man will ever commit, every disease man will ever have, he's already carried it on himself. He was raised from the dead. He's done all he's going to do. Now, will you receive him as Savior and Lord? What are you going to do with the compassion of God in the person of Jesus Christ, whose compassion loved us so much he couldn't live without us? And he paid the price so we could be with him. If you've been running from God instead of to God, I'm talking to you. If you've never surrendered all of your heart and all of your life to Jesus Christ, I'm talking to you. If you've been a religious person, you believed and you've been in church and out of church, you've been in one day and out the next, you've been up and down, you've been backslidden and then you come back and you backslide, but you've never really surrendered, I'm talking to you. It takes courage to say yes to the King of Kings because he's not going to make you do this. He's only going to offer his life to you and say, will you receive it? All over this auditorium, I'm going to ask if you'd like to get right with God tonight, if you'd like to say yes to the Savior tonight, in just a moment, I'm going to have us all raise our hands at the same time. We ask you to, to look up 
and to look at me and not bow your heads and close your eyes. Why do we do that? Because I'm going to ask you in just a minute. If you need to get right with God tonight, I want you to raise your hand when I ask you to. We'll do it in just a minute. Because we figure it this way. If you can't say yes to Jesus in this safe, friendly place where we have all made that commitment, how are you going to walk out those doors and live for Jesus Christ and live this life? If we're afraid here, how will we not be afraid out there? Don't let one moment of embarrassment or one moment of being uncomfortable stop you from the move of God in your heart right now. Holy Spirit's knocking on your door. If you've been running from him instead of to him, I'm talking to you. Never said yes to Jesus, I'm talking to you. Backslidden, I'm talking to you. Good person but never surrendered your life, I'm talking to you. I'm going to count to three. I'm going to hit this book like this, bam, and then I'm just going to ask you to raise your hand. Are you ready all over this auditorium? One, two, three, bam, let me see. Lift your hands high. I see that hand, I see that hand, I see that hand. I got it. Raise them high. I got that hand. Got it. I see it, I see it, I see it. Seven, eight. Let me see your hands. Raise them high. Nine. Raise them high. This is it. God's speaking to you. Don't stop now. Raise your hand high with boldness. There's another hand. I see it. There's a generation that's rising up, not ashamed of the gospel, not afraid of Jesus Christ. Raise your hand high. You need to get right with God tonight. You want God. Raise your hand. There's about 10 hands that went up. Anybody else? Right now, let me see your hand. I see that hand. Anybody else? Anybody else? Anybody else? God's knocking on your heart. You wish I'd shut up. I'm a grandma. I am not going to shut up. Because I know he's the only one that can change your life. I know he is God. I know he loves you. I see that hand. We got a letter from a man in prison serving a sentence for life. This is what he said. He said, I came to the rock. My girlfriend brought me. When the altar call was given by Pastor Jim, I wanted to raise my hand, but I didn't. I was afraid. I didn't do it that day. The next day, I was in a shootout. I killed a cop, and I'm in prison for life. He said, I'm a Christian now, but oh, I wish I would have taken the opportunity then to have a life change in your sanctuary. God's talking to you tonight. You don't have tomorrow. You have tonight. I can feel there's more. Who are you in here? Raise your hand now. Do not be ashamed and just do it. Who are you? All right. This is what we're going to do. We're going to stand up. We've got about five minutes and we're closing this service. If you raised your hand, I want you to grab what you brought to church with you. As we stand and as we sing this song. I want you to bring a friend or bring yourself, bring what you brought to church. Meet me at this altar and let's get changed. Let's have a life change. Let's say yes to Jesus tonight. If you didn't raise your hand, it's not too late. Come home. Come home. He loves you. He's the only one that can fix you. He is the only one that gets you. Just come on home. Quickly come. If you didn't raise your hand, it's not too late. Just come down with the rest. You're still coming. Come. Just come. come now is the day of salvation. Now is the time of salvation. Now. Now. Not tomorrow. Not next week. Now. Tonight. Forever. Everlasting. He'll give you strength. Okay. Well, I just want you to know that you were assigned guardian angels. The Bible tells us that, that your angels see the face of heaven. They see the face of God. They've also been working very hard, keeping you alive. And they are now having a party because you're saying yes to Jesus. You can smile. We're not going to the morgue. This is not a funeral. You're actually getting born again. You're getting life. You're not getting death. What we want to do is we are going to pray with you. We're going to give you a book that our pastor has written. It's real simple. It's real short. And we're going to offer you a program that we have here at the church. We're asking that we give you one year. Give us one year of your life. If you'll come to this church for one year. We promise your life will never be the same. You're not joining a cult. You're saying yes to Jesus Christ. But when I had my babies, guess what? I didn't leave them at the hospital. I brought them home and I took care of them. I fed them and I loved them and I nurtured them so they could grow up strong. 
We have a program called Spiritual Personal Trainers. It's just a friend. We just roll that way. We give friends out here. If you want a friend, there's somebody that's going to meet you five times before church services. Pastor Dave will explain it to you. You're not joining. You're not getting a program. We're saying yes to Jesus. But we want to do this quietly and privately. So if you just make a about face, and if you'll follow Pastor Dave, he's going to take you in our new believers room.